I, I'm going to say I'm, I've been very much looking forward to this um, because we have Mr. Peter Schiff and Peter, Mr. Danny Blanchflower. I've got I've got these great introductions that I, I want to I want to say, but I think everybody knows who these two gentlemen are. But you know, um, just l give me the uh, benefit of uh, of reading this. Um, so Peter Schiff, if you don't know who he is, he's an economist, financial broker, dealer, CEO, and chief global strategist of Euro Pacific Capital. He's author of The Real Crash and How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes. He's a frequent guest on every national news outlet whether you're, uh, and international news outlet, whether you're talking about CNBC, Bloomberg, Reuters, the, the gamut. And he's the host of the very popular Peter Schiff Show podcast. So welcome, Peter. And if you don't know who Mr. Danny Blanchflower is... Um, that's actually Mr. David Blanchflower. He's the Bruce V. Vauner uh, Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He's a professor of economics at the University of Sterling and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is also the author of Not Working, Where Have All the Good Jobs Gone? And that was just before COVID. Uh, he's an, he was also an external member of the Bank of England's Interest Rate Setting MPC or Monetary Policy Committee from June 2006 to June 2009. Whew, that was a lot. Gentlemen, welcome to the Trader Hi, Center. Man. Good to have Hello. you here. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Great, great. You know, um, I, I again, I've been look. I, I know myself and the rest of the community has really been looking forward to this. And uh, I, I just got to say, let's just let's, let's go ahead and jump on into it. And let's talk. Um, let's talk about central banks just in general. And let's talk about uh, some of the, it's easy to go back and take a look and see what have the mess, missteps of the, the Fed been. But let's start with you, Peter. Where do you think um, in this whole, you know, we could take a step back over the last couple of years or, you know, last several years, you might say, uh, but where has the Fed really misstepped here in the current well, environment? Well, pretty much every step was a misstep. And it's not just the Fed, it's central banks all around the world, although the Fed was kind of the leader and everybody else followed along, uh, kind of like we were the Pied Piper of, uh, of, of uh, mon monetary uh, excess and everybody else kind of uh, marched along. But the world would have been much better off without central banks. I mean, not that it would be better off if the governments just had the direct uh, you know, printing press, but we would have been better off uh, had money been created in the private sector. I, I don't think the government should be involved in, in money at all. I think the market should determine what money is and people should transact in the monetary uh, units that, uh, that provide that function the best. And to the extent that governments need money to provide services, they need to acquire it honestly through taxation. That government should not be empowered to just artificially conjure money into existence out of thin air, nor should governments be in charge of setting interest rates any more than, you know, we don't want governments to set the price of bread or the price of gas. Uh, all prices should be discovered in a free market, and that includes the interest rate. But I think because of what central banks have done, the Fed and, and, and others, uh, by keeping interest rates artificially low, which is at a level that is far below where the market would have set them. Uh, and by in inflating the money supply to the extent that they did, they really helped uh, undermine economic growth throughout the world. They helped to grow government. Governments are a lot bigger because of their relationships with central banks. And of course that has made the world poorer because the smaller the government, uh, the wealthier the people, right? Because the government is taking resources away from the private sector where they could be used e efficiently to, uh, you know, grow living standards and usurping them for uh, public consumption, uh, which is a, a, a way of squandering your resources. So central banks have helped create big government, uh, which has been a drag on global GDP, uh, but also by artificially suppressing interest rates, they have helped create massive malinvestments, misallocations of resources, financial bubbles, all sorts of problems uh, that we're now just beginning uh, to uh, feel the consequence of. And they have unleashed uh, massive inflation. Again, we're at the tip of that iceberg right now. So what we've experienced in the last year or so, this is just 
the beginning of what is coming. There's so much inflation in the pipeline already. Yes, they they really uh, went overboard after COVID, and we've barely even felt the full the full effects of that yet. But that just tapped more than a decade of inflation by central banks, zero percent interest rates, negative interest rates, quantitative easing, and so we're just starting to feel the consequences and they're going to get much, much worse as, uh, as the months and years go by. All right. Well, th- and, and uh, Dan, Dan, Danny, I'd love to hear your opinion here. By the way, we have uh, our very own um, Dale Pinkert. He's going to, he's joining us with this, uh, this, this uh, debate forum as well. But Danny, what are your thoughts on what Peter had to say? Well, I, I have been a strong critic of central banks but I disagree with almost every single word Peter said, basically. <laughs> um, I mean, having been a critic and argued that um, the actions have been mistaken and could have done better, but I think there's a couple of stories to say. I set my students over the weekend to actually go and listen to the four lectures given by Ben Bernanke at uh, George Washington, where he talks about the importance of actually introducing a central bank and what that does to declining volatility. So that's the first thing. So having central banks in principle, I mean, obviously we'd like them to be, to act appropriately, but um, I think having them there is is actually preventing um, volatility in in markets around the world. The second thing is that it seems to me that since 2006 or seven, Peter actually underestimates the scale of the negative shock that things were hit by. And I want to just give you an example. So you say you don't need central banks and that the private sector could have done everything. Well, that that would have generated Armageddon. Let me explain. So on the October the 6th, 2008, um, um, October the, so the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling was sitting in Paris and his um, assistant came up to him and said, you've got to take a phone call. It's from, um, from the, Royal, the chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, and they apparently can't make a payment this afternoon. So he goes back to his office, and in fact, um, Geithner actually confirmed this to me. So they said, to, they said to him, if you don't rescue RBS, who can't make a payment this afternoon, what do you think is going to happen? And they said to him, there's a significant probability, this is Peter's model, there's a significant probability that tomorrow every credit card in the world and every cash machine in the world stops working. And Tim Geithner took the view that, I mean, collectively, we sort of held that view in 2007, 2008. Think about what happened in the fall of 2008, where where companies like Goldman Sachs, who hadn't wanted to be banks and didn't want to be subject to the regulation, made themselves banks because they needed access to central banks' funding. So So the first thing, I'm very critical of it. But to argue that the private sector does things and it's also great. I mean, in the UK, there's a considerable debate going on. In the last week, you can imagine, I've been involved with talking about betting on a lettuce and the lettuce won. But anyway, we won't go there for a minute. <laughs> but the answer there, actually, if you look at the polling, is post-COVID, it turns out that, in fact, the, the big problem they had with the people was actually the people really liked the government involvement. So the public actually liked the fact that they were able to intervene and do furlough schemes and so on. So I think what he's done is go f- much too far. I mean, I'm a strong critic of what's happened. I'm a strong critic of the fact that in 2008, um, the Fed and the Bank of England missed the Great Recession. Um, in September 2008, the Fed hadn't even noticed it had gone into recession nine months earlier. They got it wrong between 2015 and 2020, thinking that the US was at full employment, and they've got it wrong now. So the, I, I perhaps take it back a bit. I don't disagree with everything he said. I just set that up. I, I, I think he went too far. I think he's got a series of good points. He's he gone further than me. But I, I mean, I, I, I was a strong critic, and from October 2008, seven to, 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 to October 2008, I voted alone, essentially taking Peter's position. So I'm allowed, you know, he, he, I'm allowed to be the insider critic, but I wouldn't throw the baby and the bathwater out. But in some way, I'll go back to Peter's earlier point. In some way, it might, I might be persuaded that actually not having the MPC there and allowing the Chancellor of the Exchequer to set interest rates might well have been better. Yeah, <laughs> so I, so I, 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 I made just, a move, Peter. I made a <laughs> move just, to you. 
I want to just make one point, but before I do, I want to compliment you on how neat your desk is. I don't know if you actually work at that desk. You haven't seen this one. I got, I got, I'm grading all my papers, right? I'm, I'm grading student papers. But, um, but, you know, I don't think it's right to give the central banks credit for putting out a fire that they started. I don't so disagree with that to, either. I don't disagree so, with that either. Of so, course. Yeah. So you have to go back to 2001, 2002, when Alan Greenspan slashed interest rates to yeah. 1%. Right. From that point on, I was a major critic of right. Alan Greenspan and his low interest rates. And all during the housing bubble, I was warning about the financial crisis that would result from the pop. I said, you got to raise interest rates. They're too low. Look at what you're doing to the housing market. Look at this phony economy that's being built on home equity loans and subprime mortgages. And you had Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that was guaranteeing all these mortgages. That was actually the biggest buyer of subprime mortgages in the world was the US government with their guarantee. And you had all these banks that were being insured by the FDI. I see. Right. So none of the right. banks would have got into these mortgages, but for the government, none of these mortgages would have been created. And the, the fact that the Fed kept the interest rates suppressed at 1% and then raised them in these quarter point increments, that was the problem. And I noticed that, I wrote a book about it in yeah. February of 2007. I shorted the subprime market myself in 2006. I encouraged other people to short that market. I went around the country speaking. Uh, you know, when, when Ben Bernanke said that uh, subprime was contained, I said, he's blind. I said, this is the tip of the iceberg. It's not just subprime, it's the whole uh, mortgage market. So I understood the problem. Now, had the central banks not intervened in 2008, yes, the collapse would have been greater, but it would have been worth it because the pain that we felt back then, the bankruptcies, the, the bad actors getting punished, that would have been a wake up call. Instead, we bailed everybody out, created incredible moral hazard. And now we are on the precipice more than a decade later of a much greater economic crisis and the central banks now find themselves between a rock and a hard place of their own creation. They can either allow interest rates to go up where they need to and allow everything to implode and allow all those big banks that they bailed out in 2008 fail with, only, with even worse uh, implications now, or they can destroy currency. They can have hyperinflation. And, and that I think is gonna be an even bigger disaster for the global economy uh, to wipe out the value of everybody's savings and all the, the, the paper assets. But well, okay, that's well, kind of where we are now. Okay, so let me, let me take that on. I mean, uh, you're right. When I get the kids, they're watching it this weekend, I get them to watch the full videos and I say, what's the missing thing here? And of course, the, the Bernanke spends a lot of time talking about what you just said. And, and the thing they're supposed to spot is that he was in charge of regulating it right so he never actually says you know that i should have regulated it and it was my mistake okay that that's the first thing the second thing is uh, the other thing which really is important is how little dissent there is within the fed so an example if you since since greenspan greenspan there's not been a single governor that's ever dissented in any decision in the last 25 years so obviously that's a part of it now well, did I, Bernie, I think, did, did no, let me just say, try to danny can and, I do one uh, quick thing and then you sure, can jump go in? Ahead. I, mean, I mean, the other thing is, uh, I, I would say two things. There is no evidence that if you allow collapse to come, that you don't, you, and you kill out the zombies, you kill out the non-zombies. And in a way, I would say this relevant to you, Peter, is that at the MPC and the FOMC, and all the discussion that I know, and I talked to everybody in 2008, what you said was never discussed by anybody for a nanosecond. There was oh, never... Yeah. And the, I mean, there was never such a, just, now you may argue, that, hang on, but you may argue what your point is, but the, the point is that it has no play. Sorry, Dale. Well, that, that's, that's because of the politics that are involved, because no politician wants, you know, to swallow the bitter, bitter tasting medicine. But that's the practicalities of it. The practicalities of what you're saying ain't going to happen. But, but you can't blame capitalism for the flaws of socialism. I didn't blame it. I didn't blame it. Yeah, I didn't blame but, it. You know that, Peter. I didn't blame no, it. But my I, point I think, is, I didn't blame it. A central bank is a socialist concept. Having the a government 
<laughs> fix a price is a socialist concept. Avoiding Armageddon is not a socialist. Avoiding Armageddon is not a socialist. No, no. Policy. The way you avoid Armageddon is with free market capitalism. It's government interference in the market that creates these problems. Yes, there would have been a massive People collapse. aren't going to vote for it. In the UK, people are not going to vote for it. That's well, the I agree. Whether you say that, that is fine. Now, it ain't that practical. is... That is another happen. debate, right? That is why democracy is not a good form of government, <laughs> right? <laughs> but all the, all the other thing, alternatives are worse. Yeah, Let's get if, Dale get in. Let's like, let if Dale you go back, something. if you look at America in the 19th century, when we were far less democratic and we were on a gold standard, we had much greater economic growth during that century oh, come on, than we did come during on, the 20th. Come on, but Keynes wrote... Um, Mr. Churchill and all that, and when, when Churchill put us back on the gold standard at 486, so I don't believe that, Tosh. No, Come on, Dale, it's your go. We did, we did have, have the deepest the, 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 the British pound was a lot stronger the Civil War. when it was, when it was sterling. You know, Britain, the British Central Bank was dumb enough to sell all their gold uh, back in night 2001 the, the pound price of gold has gone up 10x since they since they unloaded their gold. And it's going to go up another 10x probably in the next five years. Uh, the British are going to be buying that gold back, but they're going to be paying a lot more for it. Okay. Uh, on, so we have definitely polarity here between <laughs> Peter well, and Danny. that's why they invited and, us. Yeah, and Danny, um, so you're not a great fan of the people that steer the ship at these central banks, but you believe we need central banks for emergencies. Well, correct? I think so. I think so. Um, I think there's a, a, a reason particularly to step in. I mean, I sort of have the view that in a way like Peter has, I have the view that in good times, you, the public sector steps out of the way. And then in bad times, the public sector steps in. And I agree in many senses with what Peter said. I mean, if you think that they didn't regulate the thing appropriately and allow the subprime to go. But then if you think in 2008, think, think about what the central bank did. I mean, and, and, I, and literally there was no real dissent at the Fed. And this is all true today, no dissent anywhere. Uh, and I dissented for a year. And then eventually <laughs> the central bank steps in in panic mode. It steps in, just an example at the MPC, it steps in in panic mode. It cuts rates by 150 basis points and 100 basis points. And it realizes that it's got to do quantitative easing, but they probably should have worked that out 25 years ago about how to do it. So we had worked out by November 08, you had to do it. Well, Mervyn King was so asleep at the wheel, it took him five months to work out even how to do it. And so the responses were really bad. And think today, I, I think today is a really bad indicator. Think of the complications we've talked about today. What, uh, so wh wh where are we going for? What's going to happen to COVID? What's going to happen to the war? Is this driven by, is this driven by too much um, demand? Is it just supply shocks? Is it temporary? Is it not? And what you've seen on, on all of the central banks is they're all saying the same thing, all, all happy to be together. And this is back in a way to Peter's point. They're all happy to be together and they're all happy to be wrong. I mean, it's fine to be wrong. As long as everybody else is wrong, it's just if fine. Have so there, there, we, have, we have a whole there. way of thinking, which is that it's perfectly okay to be wrong. I mean, M Mervyn King's view was, well, you couldn't expect the government of the Bank of England to have any foresight. And I used to say, well, he had to say that because he didn't have any. And the view is that it doesn't matter whether you get it wrong or right. You just say, well, we all got it wrong. And well, so what? Well, so I do, think well, that, I do think that we're in a period of group think. Central bankers have made errors now. Uh, I think the raising of rates is a huge mistake. And what we learned from the UK this week, the markets are sitting on a knife edge and globally they're sitting on a knife edge. And I had never expected them to collapse at the speed that they did. Well, remember the mistake for a couple of things, but the mistake isn't raising rates now. The mistake was lowering so much in the past and then keeping them so low. No, so I don't long. agree with that. You sit at the MPC. So what would you have liked them to have done? Raise rates and generated a deeper recession? No. But there was, there was, any, but you have any, to understand. Any, hang on. There, anybody there was, who, th who took the view between 2010 and 2020, or anybody who voted for a rate rise was in error, and any central bank, including the, Euro the Swedish central bank and the European central bank, any one of them that even thought of raising yeah. rates or did raise rates was what, a disaster what, and was in error. What, what that's, you the, that's the empirical evidence. That's the what empirical you have evidence. To, what you have to understand is the mistakes well, were made. The mistakes were made 
during the artificial boom when interest rates were suppressed at levels that were lower than the no, free market. I don't market agree with that because you just underestimate the scale of the shock. The no, scale of the I, negative I'm not, shock. Let me finish my point. No, no, hang on. no, no, no I don't, I'm, I'm going to say this. You sit on the central bank. What were you supposed to do? You say the scale of the negative shock comes. And what we're having to do no. is we're having to counter what's happening with fiscal policy. Fiscal no. policy was overly tight. Any vote to, to raise rates was in error. There's no, Look, there's no let doubt. Let me get back to my point. The, the mistakes were made during the boom. The recession is when the mistakes are fixed. Okay. You need the recession. You have to let the recession run its course. No, don't so agree with that. Yes, you do. Because otherwise, all you're doing all. is reinforcing the mistakes. You're making the problem worse. No, and no, no. Let me finish this there's point. No empirical said, evidence. Just, no said, empirical let me evidence finish this point, and then you can address me. No, no, you no. no, said no. There is that, no is, you have let me speak. finish this one point. Okay. Let me finish this one point. But you made the you same point eight times. You said that the central bankers might make mistakes. They're, of course, they're, they're, everything they do is going to be a mistake. They're being motivated by politics. We, you, you want a free market to work. The, a, a small group of people politically motivated are never going to be as efficient as the entire free market acting independently. So just like you don't want a group of people fixing prices of bread or milk or whatever, you don't want them deciding on what the money supply should be, what the interest rate should be. That, that, that is going to guarantee problems. And the sooner you get the government, the central bank out, the better. To say, so oh, there you we go, need Peter. more government. So to, no, to, to people are coming, hold on, guys. Live. Hold on, guys. Peter people are coming that. around to Peter's view, Danny. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Who needs the Fed? Mm -hmm. And if they make well, a mistake and they can't pull a Captain Sully and <laughs> land this B24 well, on the Hudson, There'll be an even louder cry well, for dissolve the Fed. Do you evidence. agree, Peter, that that's where no. we're going? I dissolving know. the Fed. I, I think I think we're going to a a crisis, a, a currency crisis, a dollar crisis, a sovereign debt crisis. I think that as everything starts to implode again, the the Fed is going to make the same mistake that it made in 2020, the same mistake it made in 2008, the same mistake it made in 2001. Okay, it is They're going to create inflation to try to bail out uh, companies and prop up the government and prop up bad debts and all that. And it, it, the, the inflation is going to run out of control. I mean, and then, you know, okay. you're going to have... You know, you've been looking for a failing dollar, Peter, for as long as I've known you. And long term, you're right. But since uh, since Biden was elected, we've had a huge run in the dollar. That's and only most of the that's analysts only, that, that let me answer your question. That's only your highs. That that's only relative to other fiat currencies. If you look at purchasing power of the dollar, okay. how much you can buy in the it's lost a lot of value since Biden was president. Prices okay. have gone way up. We and haven't so, had a dollar crisis yet. Not yet. What's going to trigger it? What's going to trigger, gonna trigger it? it is going to be the Fed backing away from its tough talk on inflation fighting when a financial crisis is either imminent or has happened, just like we just saw in the UK. Uh, there's going to be a major blow up. What's deep enough to rates, handle it? What what will where will money flow when that's happening to other fiat? No, no, or just no, I commodities. think it's going to go out of fiat into real money. I think it'll go into gold, commodities, other real assets. People are going to get rid of fiat currencies. They're not going to hold on to uh, negative yielding paper anymore because the world is going to recognize where this is headed, that the central bankers are all bark and no bite, that if you own fiat currency, particularly the dollar, it's a bottomless pit that you're going to see your wealth evaporate. And people are going to get out and they're going to look for alternatives. What do you think, Danny, and, when it comes to the dollar and the privilege the U.S. has of being the reserve currency with no one else to be able to replace it? Well, certainly it is a privileged place. And I think in a sense, the mistake in the U.K. was that they kind of assumed that the U.K. was as well. And that very quickly kind of crashed around them. If the U.K. isn't in that position then presumably lots of other places in the world are not. But I, th I think what's coming, I, could, I, could, I mean, I, I don't agree with almost anything Peter said. I think the evidence now is that the right way to think of this is that what we're going to see now within very short period 
is actually deflation. I don't think there's any historical evidence whatsoever to sustain anything that Peter said about inflation coming. If you go and look, so I'll give you two, three bits of evidence. The first is if you go back to 2008, remember that in August 2008, almost everything, Bullard and everything everybody else was saying, kind of what Peter was saying, was the same. And inflation was about 5.6. A year later, it was minus two. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we have now got some really great data for the UK for about 800 years. So we have data from the Bank of England of inflation in the UK for 800 years. There is no evidence historically that high inflation actually leads to quite high inflation. In fact, of the 800 years of data, because you know, imagine take out, take out the central bank as Peter wants, so this is what you'd go back to. 340 of those were deflation. And every example of a major shock generates, because the private sector does it, no public sector there, it generates deflation. So the three comparable examples are the Black Death, the eruption of the Mount Tambura, which generated winter in the summer in Europe and huge high price food prices. And then thirdly, um, after the great influenza, we went to deflation. So I think it looks like peak inflation is there. Anybody who keeps saying that inflation is high doesn't actually understand how inflation is calculated. It's calculated by 12 single numbers and each month we add one and we deduct one. And all that we're going to see now is for the next six months, very large numbers being dropped. And so that gets you that gets you to two percent very easily by June. And if the numbers are lower than that, we're probably in negative numbers by the summer. That's the default outcome, because there are no examples of what Peter and Summers and anybody else. There are no historical examples of that. And then now what we're seeing in these surveys, including in um, in, in the Michigan survey, is the proportion of people who say they think in the next 12 months prices are going to go down is now at 10%, up from four, two months ago. So the, the inevitable thing then is if you're raising rates thinking that you can you know, avoid a recession, you can have a nice soft landing, well, actually, you're going to generate deflation. If you generate it more in the US than elsewhere and you have to have screeching U-turns, which is what's coming, um, the, the, and and my, my evidence is actually that the U.S. was, was actually in recession starting this year. If you look at consumer I recall, Danny, uh, your happiness index last June. Yeah, my happiness index. So if you go back to looking at, if you go back and try and predict, try and take the NBR's recession calls, the, the only variable that predicts it is consumer confidence. Everything else is ex ante. If you take the consumer confidence data, a 15-point drop in the consumer confidence measure within 12 months gets you every one of the prior recessions. It never gives you a bum call. It gave you exactly the right call in 2008. It was by, by June of 2008, you could see it was predicting recession in December. These data, by the middle of last year, were predicting that recession was coming probably at the start of, the, of 2022. We got two negative quarters of GDP growth, and those are likely to be revised downwards. So I think the, the likelihood is that macro errors are what's likely to impact the dollar, because we're going to see rapid reversal, a rapid down, basically rapid reversal of the rate rises. And we're already seeing that in the UK. I mean, so yesterday, I think it was yesterday, or was it Thursday? Bank of England talking about rate rises. Well, the deputy governor came out and said, hold on, we're not going to do that. That was two days ago. So I, th I think what we've done is overtalked it, overthought about the crisis that coming. Actually, what's coming is unemployment and deflation. And unemployment is much worse in any measure of any kind. Unemployment is let me, much let me, worse. Dan Danny, let, let, yeah, let, 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 let's, yeah, let, let's let Peter step in and, and his rebuttal regarding inflation. So, Peter, go, go please ahead. go ahead. Yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, I agree on the recession call. In fact, I was predicting that the recession would start in Q1 of 2022, back in 2021. And I'm pretty sure the U.S. has been in recession yeah, I agree all with that. year. Yep. And in fact, I was on television very frequently in the first half of 2008, claiming that we were already in a recession. And I turned out to have been right then. The experts were in denial. But, you know, when you go back historically over 800 years in the UK and you try to, you know, look at inflation, I would suggest that you can't go back beyond the fiat system. So the years where the UK was on a gold standard, you had real money. And so that's very different 
than the way politicians can react to problems when they can create money out of thin air. So you really just have to look back to the fiat monetary era to try to see what what might happen. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of countries that have gone through hyperinflation, right? They didn't have a history of hyperinflation, and then they wiped out their currency. And I think that is the danger uh, that we face. And, 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 you know, historically, there has never been a fiat currency that has survived. They've all gone to zero. It's just a question of how long it takes them to get there. And so I don't think the monetary system that we have now is going to be the exception to that rule. I mean, the, these worthless pieces of paper that are circulating at, as opposed to legitimate currency or money, uh, they're going to lose their value. They're going to succumb uh, to the pressures that politicians are under to prop everything up and bail everything out. Now, I agree. Unemployment is going to get much higher. I think that this recession is going to get worse. I think a lot of the companies that were born out of the era of cheap money are now going to die. A lot of there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies. A lot, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen. Now, it's actually good stuff from the point of creative destruction. We, you know, a, a lot of these companies never should have been created. A lot of these jobs never should have been created. We needed different jobs. We needed more productive jobs, but we made a lot of mistakes uh, because of this uh, socialist monetary policy that we followed. But I think all of this is going to be a catalyst for even more inflation because as people lose their jobs. And now governments start supplying them with additional benefits that they have to they have even larger budget deficits. They have to print even more money. So you have a situation where the economy becomes less productive because fewer people are employed. You have more money printing because of the budget deficits getting larger and larger. And then the central banks are printing more and more money. And then as the inflation is pushing up bond yields even higher, and highly indebted governments can't afford to pay, now they have to monetize even more. And you get into this vicious cycle uh, that you know ultimately can lead to a implosion in the value of the currency as you get a mass exit from the currency and velocity really picks up because then nobody wants to hold paper. They want to get rid of it the minute they get their hands on it like a hot potato. And, and so not only is money supply going up, but the velocity is compounding because you want to get rid of the money the minute you get it. So there's some tremendous risks out there that, you know, you're shaking your head. You're just oblivious to them. But remember, well, right now, Peter, okay, I'm, 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 saying, I'm, saying, every word of it. That makes I'm no sense. saying that the dollar I want, I'm about to finish wrecking. the point. I mean, I want to counter that. The wrecking I, before I forget it, let me just finish that the point. makes no sense whatsoever. Let, let Peter ever. finish his point. When, when, makes no sense. When, when this inflation, when, when the high inflation that's being measured by the consumer price index has started last year in 2021, all these central bankers said, oh, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. Uh, it's a good thing that it's above 2% because we have to make up for all those years that we were below 2%. We just want to average inflation to 2%. And then when it got to 4 or 5%, oh, don't worry about it. It's transitory. It's going to go away on its own. They kept saying that and saying that. And then reluctantly, once inflation becomes a huge problem politically, and now it's over 8% in the U.S., they finally said, OK, I guess we were wrong, although it was like Arthur Fonzarelli. They really couldn't say wrong. You know, but, you know, they did. They, they came close to saying they were wrong. But now they're like, OK, it's it's not uh, transitory. Now we're going to get rid of the inflation. Now they're pretending that the inflation they thought was transitory is going to go away with their ineffective rate hikes. You're not going to get rid of 8% inflation with 4% interest rates. So we're not even at four. We need 10. We need 12. And we need big oh. cuts in government spending. We need to take those budget deficits complete and turn talk. them into surpluses. None of that is going to happen. Talk. Okay, let's, let's, hear, let's hear what Danny has to say. Danny, Danny, let's hear what you have to say regarding that particular no, no, I topic as far as raising I have rates. never heard such unadulterated nonsense in all my life. That's what they so said to me session. before the 2008 financial crisis when they called you know, me Dr. Doom. You, you, want, you want me to have a debate or you just want to carry on giving you a soapbox? No, okay, no, hey, you, debate me. you want to let debate me speak me. or do you want to just go on for the hour? You can do whatever you like. No, go ahead. I'm, you you just said that what I said was nonsense. People well, you, people always say what I say is nonsense until until it, it, well, it turns out to be right, and then they accuse me of being a, a stop. You want to talk for well, the let's, hour? Let's let him, let's let him go. You want Danny. to talk for the hour? Feel free, Danny. Please, please, please. Let's let's uh, you're let's, let's hear your let me speak. Are you, have you finished? Okay. I'm I'm asking you to talk. I'm inviting you to debate a point. Fine. 
Well, the first thing to say is that during a recession, inflation tends to fall, not least because wage, wage growth tends to fall. I've written, pro, I'm probably the biggest authority in the world on it. So the evidence is that workers' bargaining power weakens, wages weaken, people's spending power weakens, which means that actually inflation falls. Second thing, what we saw was absolutely transitory inflation. Here's what happened. We had a shock. It was called COVID. That generated a supply shock. Bang. Once-off shocks. Okay. So then the, the transitory shock starts to dissipate. And what you've seen then is it gets hit by another transitory shock, which is called the war. And if you look at, you know, in Europe especially, that's very much impacted things. So what you have, the first one starts to dissipate, the second one starts to dissipate. What you see in the data is that over the last three months, inflation has been zero, zero, and 0 0.4. So inflation is currently running at 1.6 and probably slowing. What you're gonna see both in the UK and in the US over the next six months is the once-off shocks drop out. Having been a policymaker, let me explain to you. Think of this, you have inflation's coming along at zero. Every month it's zero, right? And then one month you get 10. And you say, wow, the central bank's gotta to respond to that 10, as you just said. The central bank, it's 10%, it's gotta to respond to it. And it's then zero, zero. So inflation's 10, it's 10. So the central bank should do absolutely nothing, should respond not at all, because what it knows is that in 11 months time, it's gonna go back to zero again. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. The question is, what should the central bank, do, central bank do at the forecast horizon? And what it knows very well is that the things you've talked about clearly are transitory, because what we're seeing is a big number like 1.2. And in fact, in one month in the UK in April, it's gonna drop a 2.4, and I guess it's going to replace it with a minus 0.2. So on a single month, inflation is going to drop. And the question for, for people like you is, so you think that when inflation goes up, you should raise rates. But you never say, you never say when inflation drops, as it's going to do for the next six months in a row, it's going to drop by 0.6, it's going to drop by 1, it's going to drop by 1.2, and maybe even more. It's always very symmetric. So the idea that this is not transitory is for the birds. And central bankers should not respond to, to small and temporary changes. So I would explain how a central banker makes a decision, which is what I did. You yeah, focus okay. on what you think the economy is going to look like in two years' time. You say that's the forecast arising as that's, that's what decisions do. It takes that amount of time. So I have in my head that inflation is going to be two in two years' time. Does a piece of evidence, some nuance in the data, for the next month or two, does it change my view? Well, no, unless unless it's expected, or unless it, unless I hadn't expected it. Central uh, bank um, should not respond, and this is why how you're going to how you do interest rates. You respond um, by what you think. I'm finished by what you think is going to happen at the forecast horizon, and all the evidence now is that you're completely wrong. The evidence is I, that the Bank of England is actually forecasting it. The last point: the Bank of England, its current forecast says. There's a 60% probability in, uh, in the forecast horizon that inflation will be below one and a 20% probability that it will be below zero. And that right. seems exactly. right. So the, the yeah. evidence seems to be that it is transitory. Central banks shouldn't respond to it. And the danger is that all this rate hiking is going to generate a recession and it's going to be a deflationary recession, disinflationary and deflationary. That's, so that's just, where we are. There's a lot there I want to respond to, but, you know, it reminds me of the old joke. They invented economists to make weathermen look good. You know, the, the weathermen have a better chance of telling you the weather in two years than and, and, and a forecast. I made a speech in April 2008, and I said the U.S. is in recession starting at the beginning of 2008. Right, let, let, so let, I let, did let it pretty good, actually, Val. All right, well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me finish the point here because... Oh, well, that's the point. His story, well, I don't want people forecasting. I want the markets doing stuff, but... Well, hang on, um, well, in 2008, let, let oh, right, in August 2008, the markets were saying that interest rates were going to be 5% for the next three years. That's what they thought. Right. So markets make let, errors. Let me, let me, right. let me finish the point saying, that I'm trying to errors. make in response to what you said. Peter, Peter, go ahead. Now, let me even remember what I was, what I was going to say. Good. So when people are, inflation is not caused by workers demanding wages. Inflation so is, is caused by governments creating money, 
by expanding the money supply. It's not created by the private sector. When you have a lot of people working, that produces more goods. That, that tends to lower prices, not increase them. When, when COVID, when in 2020, in March of 2020, when the central banks made the mistake of lowering interest rates, I said at that time, it was highly inflationary. At that time, none of the central bankers were worried about inflation. They all were scared about deflation. But I knew that by reducing supply and increasing money while ordering people to stop producing and printing money, it was a highly inflationary thing. But we've been creating inflation for over a decade. So we're just getting started right now. What we're experiencing is the beginning. And the only reason we've seen a drop in these headline numbers is because we had a decline in oil prices. But beneath the surface, if you look at the core consumer prices, they're getting worse. Prices are going up faster now for a lot of goods and services than they were a year ago. And the temporary decline that we got in oil prices is temporary. Oil is going to make a new high. Other commodities are going to make a new high. And so you're only getting a little bit of relief on the headline number as the core numbers are getting worse because you've got more than a decade of inflation in the rearview mirror. The money supply has been expanded dramatically. Governments are bigger than they were. And all of that costs money. Every dime that the government spends must be paid for by the population. And if it's not going to be paid for through taxes, it's going to be paid for through inflation. And there is a huge inflation tax that has already basically been levied on the public. And now they're going to be paying that tax in the form of higher prices. And it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's just going to get worse. All right, Peter, I'm going to um, I'm going to give it to Danny. You got two minutes. Sure. Well, again, the reality was during the period 2010 to 20, inflation surprised on the low side. Wage growth was actually surprised on the low side. And actually, the evidence recently is that prices of all sorts of things are tumbling. I mean, the thing I watch especially is the, is the Drury Freight Index, which has been falling at about 5% a week for the last five or six weeks. Other prices are tumbling which is um, indicative of why we're seeing this. Obviously, oil prices are tumbling. The other thing is that um, the core numbers tend to take a little while to, to fall, as they did in 2008, because it takes a while for the energy stuff to feed into them. So I think the answer is that there is no evidence of... I've got... I'm good. That's great. I'll, do, I'll play there, Blake, no problem. I think there's no <laughs> evidence that there's, a, there's, there's basically um, inflation sitting there about to burst out. Wage growth around the world is slowing. And remember that, I mean, in a sense, the reason for Volcker was his argument that actually wage price inflation was what was going on. And the fear of central bankers has been that there was going to be a wage price spiral, which today seems to be for the birds. Do I get a bonus, Blake, if I finish early? I'm done. <laughs> all right, Peter, go ahead. It's, all, it, it's you. <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't think there's any such thing as a wage price spiral or cost push inflation uh, politicians always try to come up with creative explanations for inflation to try to deflect the responsibility from themselves. Inflation has one cause, uh, and that's government, that's central banks. I mean, literally, inflation means an expansion of the money supply, because that's what you're doing. You're inflating. Prices don't inflate. Prices go up, they go down, but that happens as a consequence of inflation. Free markets tend to reduce prices. That's what's so great about them. You get more productivity. You get more stuff produced for less money. So the natural tendency of prices is to decline. And that is a good thing. But unfortunately, governments rob the public of that good thing by debasing money and creating inflation. But at this point, the inflation that they've been creating for the better part of a decade has gotten way out of hand. And we're about to experience the unfortunate consequences of reckless money printing that really began not just following the 2008 financial crisis, but really began with Alan Greenspan early in his tenure following the 1987 stock market crash. That's when he set the precedence for all the mistakes that he made uh, in the 1990s. And then he gave the baton to his protege, Ben Bernanke, who continued those mistakes, uh, gave the baton to Janet Yellen, who gave the baton uh, to um, Powell, who may now be uh, you know, the fall guy who is uh, stuck uh, holding the bag. Uh, but we're going to see, we're going to experience the, the consequences of fiat money. And hopefully uh, the world understands that 
what is about to happen is a consequence of government and central banking and socialism. And the solution is not to double down on those policies, but to embrace free market capitalism and sound money, which would be a gold standard, uh, not a fiat standard administered by a Politburo of central bankers. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, wow. Dan, in your response? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm afraid I just don't agree with any of that. So the, the reality is, I think we, we, sat, we sat at the Bank of England in 2008 in the fall, and the staff were trying to think about what, what's going on with the, with the scale of the shock that's coming. What could we do to counter it? And I accept the fact that you might argue that, you know, they, they should have done stuff before, but you are where you are, and I wasn't on the committee then. And so basically we got to the point where it was clear from all the staff doing things that basically what you needed was probably interest rates at about minus four and a half, right? About minus four and a half. That was essentially what the forecasts were. We were told at the bank that actually in the UK, you couldn't cut rates below 0.5 for, for reasons particularly to do with the building societies. And they've, they've changed that. So at the time we thought very strongly about the zero lower bound. So then what do you sit and do? You say, well, this means that the recession is going to be much worse. And Bernanke's, which I agree with, he was asked, what would unemployment have been if the Fed hadn't acted? And he said 25% as it was in the, in the Great Recession, in the Great Depression. So I agree with that. And so in the end, you vote, I mean, I voted for, I don't know, it's 300 billion of QE. Why did I do it? And the answer was, because if you can't lower the price of money, you need to raise the quantity of it. Now you can argue about what was done later and all that stuff and the scale of it and so on. But this is beyond the, hold the clock over, how much, I can't see it, but play, oh, play, hold it, I, so, I got 30 seconds. So, so you can argue about what the second order things were and what they purchased and so on. But the reality was that unemployment would have been 25% or so if the Fed and fiscal authorities around the world hadn't acted. I take the view that the Bernanke and Gordon Brown saved the world. <laughs> oh well hey you know that's uh it, and peter you're gonna get to respond to that uh and you got uh two minutes or less again you can't take credit for putting out a fire that you yourself lit and of course they put it out with gasoline and that's why it's going to come back bigger than ever as bad as it would have been in 2008 if they did the right thing they should have done it because it's going to be so much worse to try to do the right thing now and again you know, I was a huge critic of the quantitative easing programs when they were announced and the 0% interest rates. When Ben Bernanke was telling Congress that it was temporary, I said it was a monetary roach motel, that there would be more QE than Rocky movie. When Ben Bernanke assured Congress that he wasn't monetizing the debt, that every, all the bonds they bought in QE1 would be back on the market and sold quickly. I said he was lying, that those bonds would never get sold. They would buy more and more and more because that's the predicament that we're in now. You can never get off the monetary heroin. And that's why we're going to make the mistake in this coming crisis, which is just getting started, of monetizing the debt by an even greater degree. Uh, we're going to print more money. And you know, when you have a, a economic model that tells you that you need negative 4% interest rates, you know that you've got to throw away that model because it's wrong. Interest rates have to be positive. People don't loan money to lose money. You loan money to, because you have to get paid for the time value of that money and for the risk that you take that you might not get repaid. You know, And so there's got to be a return available on a loan. And so this era of negative interest rates, and even now, rates are negative in real terms. Even though you have positive nominal interest rates, all the interest rates are negative in real terms. And this is highly distortive and destructive to a free market economy that needs savings. The real key to economic growth is savings and underconsumption. That's what leads to capital investment and higher living standards. And central bankers and governments are undermining legitimate wealth creation with these artificially low interest rates. And the sooner it ends, the better. All right. Um, you know, we, we have about 10 minutes left of this debate and I, and I love, I love the passion. Can I get, can I get one minute? And, I just absolutely. You know, I, I'd love I, to I give you guys both one, one minute just to, uh, yeah, absolutely. Just to clean it just, up. And then, me, yeah, let me just give thoughts? a little counter to right. that from this, from the last 10 days. Yeah. I, I'm going to do one minute. Okay. So what you saw in the, in the UK was this crazy mini budget, which basically, <laughs> you know, the markets didn't like, but actually on the Monday, Pension funds were essentially in the UK, essentially they were by the afternoon on Monday, 
they were essentially bankrupt. So the Bank of England had to step in. So the counter is, well, what if, you know, what if the Bank of England hadn't stepped in? Well, pension funds would have collapsed. Last week on Monday, they stepped in, provided assets. These pension funds were engaged in a fire sale of assets. So there's a classic example where essentially, obviously this is driven by the, what, the, what the government had done. And on the Tuesday, mortgage markets closed because, and they were unable to price products. But there's a good example. I'm doing good, I'm gonna be done. There's a good example. Central bank has to step in because of last week, without it, the, without it, the price, because these pension funds had basically hedged wrongly. And without the Bank of England, they'd have been dead last week. Four right. seconds, right. I did. That, Peter, Peter, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, that's actually a perfect example of what I'm saying. What happened with those pension funds is the British government requires these pension funds to provide a certain level of pension. They don't allow them to raise the contributions. They don't allow them to cut benefits. And so they forced them to lever up because they lowered interest rates so much they couldn't buy bonds to earn enough yield to meet their pension obligations. They couldn't raise the rates. They couldn't cut the benefits. So they did the only thing they could under the circumstances was they levered up. And the only reason they were so levered up was because of the government, because of how cheap they made it to borrow money. So they levered up their low yielding bond portfolios to meet their obligations. And then when they finally let interest rates go up, they pricked their own bubble. That's what happened. So don't give the Bank of England credit for saving the pension system that never would have been in jeopardy, but for the misguided policies of not only the Bank of England, but of the government of the UK. And I believe the United States is going to face the same choice. I mean, the debt to GDP in the UK is 85%. It's 130% in the United States. We have a lot more debt than the British, and we're in a, we have a much bigger debt bubble, and it's going to blow up in an even more spectacular manner. So, gentlemen, we have we have just a few minutes, and and you know the 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 fact of the matter is we are here. Um, it's not you know we could always go back and look back and say, um, what's happened has happened, right? So, what do you and and Danny to you first? What what do you think is the way forward for central banks? I, I know you're obviously pro central banks. You were a central banker. What's the way forward? And um, Peter, we're going to then go to you and say, you know, we are where we're at. Um, you want to abolish the Fed. Great, but how does that get done? So let's just take a couple minutes. Start with you, Danny. Um, go ahead. Well, I think I think we, one of the big well, it, abolishing it's not really where we, where I think we should go. We're going to have to think about what its remit is and what they do and how they act. One of the big things I think is is diversity of view. I mean, in a sense that it's this debate is. I mean, in a sense, central bankers. I mean, Peter's right in many senses. This debate is not held within the central banks, right? The narrowness of the debate is very, is very, it really is very narrow. The diversity of view is almost nil. Let me just give you an example of that. You know, you, you want to have these wide discussions. So in the UK, the MPC consists of five people who were, used to work on the, in the treasury, a civil servant, uh, sorry, a banker, and three professors of economics, and all of them live in London, right? And they all basically have the same training and the same view. So I think we have to try and get diversity of view. Um, and, and obviously, the, in a sense, the arguments against the central bank, and Peter's right in this sense, the arguments against the central banks is they messed up. I think they messed up in 08. They messed up, we think, perhaps for different reasons from 2010 to 2020. And they probably, I mean, they, they, they're making very large errors now. So obviously, the diversity of view, what the remit is, what they're doing, all of that has to be rethought. I mean, a final point, Richard Clarida was asked, why is it that the Fed has a 2% target? And you know what his answer was? Because some guy in New Zealand dreamed it up. <laughs> That's but, true. That's uh, literally you know, true. Yeah. And they said, so could it have been three? So basically it could have been any number he picked. But literally some guy in New Zealand picked it. And that's the only reason we have a 2% target. Let, let, <laughs> let me correct. Peter, go ahead. Let me correct one thing, because I was very familiar with the monetary policy in New Zealand. I was a big investor in New Zealand back in the time where they implemented that. Uh, Don Brash was the initial uh, uh, chairman of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand when they implemented the 2% uh, ceiling. It was never a target. The 2% right. was a ceiling. The right. goal was not to get inflation up to 2%. It was to make sure it never got that high. And so if inflation got to 2%, that meant it's too high. The idea that we should target higher inflation is complete nonsense. 2% is not better than 1%. 1% is not better than zero. The, 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 the central banks manufactured this target 
as an excuse, as a pretense to create inflation, to bail out overly indebted governments, to prop up overinflated asset bubbles. That's what happened. We never needed higher inflation. And I, I was very critical of all the central banks. Every time they said we needed more inflation, we have don't have enough inflation. I said, eventually, you're going to have way more inflation than you know what to do with. Be careful what you wish for, because I guaranteed that they would get it. And that is uh, where we are right now. And now they cannot put this inflation genie back in the bottle. It's impossible. Peter, can I ask you, do you think, and I know Danny, What I, I think I know what Danny's response is going to be here, but do, do you think central banks are a, a good or at least... <clears throat> Good. A good. Maybe is are they are efficient, smoothing mechanisms in no. in, a, in a in a panic market. Uh, uh, well, well, first of all, the markets are panicking mostly because of what they've already done. So it's like you you ha you ha you can't just look at it. You know, during the busts, you have to look at its role in creating the booms. Look, I think we would be better off with sound money and no central banks. I know that's a big ask. Uh, I think. Uh, what I would like to see would be maybe restore the original mission of the Federal Reserve. A lot of people don't understand why it was created. It was created to have an elastic money supply, which meant that when, it, when times were good, the money supply expanded. But when times were bad, it contracted. They were supposed yeah. to contract the money supply when the economy turned down. They never do that. They just expanded even faster. The initial Federal Reserve was not allowed to hold any U.S. treasuries on its balance sheet. The, 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 the formers of the Federal Reserve did not want the Federal Reserve to be used to finance government spending. So they made it illegal for the Federal Reserve to own any U.S. treasuries. And of course, under the original Federal Reserve Act, each Federal Reserve note was backed 100 percent by commercial paper, which were the uh, notes of other banks, and 40 percent by gold. And all of the Federal Reserve notes were not only backed by gold, but redeemable on demand in gold. So I would like to at least go back to the original Federal Reserve that was passed by Congress initially, because had they proposed the Federal Reserve that we have today, it never would have been ratified. Nobody would have been in favor of what we have now. This was and like a camel's nose under the tent, where we started off with maybe some benevolent purpose, and we ended up with this evil monster, which is where we are. And 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 I know we're bleeding into the next um, uh, interview. I just, but Danny, your response here, because, you know, I, I and I personally believe you got central bankers that are reappointed and they're like, hey, look, I don't want to hold the potato here. I'll just pass it off to the next person. And so, uh, you know, to so to uh, Peter's point, I agree with him. What what are your closing thoughts here? Well, I, th I mean, it, it, unless central banks are actually, you know, doing doing something helpful, then obviously that you, you don't want them there. I would I just would sort of go to Peter's point in the sense that. I, I take the view that the, I, what you want to see, it's not so much, I mean, it's not so much, Peter, that it's a 2% target. In a sense, think about, I don't really care if it's two, three or four. What, what you want is sort of certainty, right? So if it's two and whizzing around, maybe four and fairly stable is better. So the first thing is it, the volatility is something that you want to remove from the markets. But I just would say back to Peter's point, I think what we've learned since that New Zealand thing is that Having two has actually brought to bear the zero lower bound more than people have thought. So Olivia Blanchard and others are actually arguing that, you know, those kinds of policies, you know, 25 years ago, we never thought the zero was it was in the in the game. And all the textbooks have things all sort of intersecting in the positive quadrants. So I think there's an argument to say that perhaps, you know, perhaps a target that's higher and prevents us getting to the zero lower bound. Is a big deal, but but the reality, despite Peter saying all the time, inflation's the problem. Actually, the problem has been falling prices. Think of Japan. Think of Japan. Japan's world has been once you get down close to this zero lower bound, inflation is low and it moves back and forth between inflation and deflation. So I'm I'm concerned about that, but I do think well, there's a reality now, but, which is the zero. Me, I got to make one closing deal. point though. Well, okay, okay good. Do, but. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Only an economist quick. would be concerned about falling prices because consumers love falling prices. Falling prices, everybody would Why like would it if gas got cheaper, if food got cheaper, if their rent went down. Why would down. you buy a house, Peter, when prices are falling? Because you, you need a house. Why, why would you buy a house? Because, because you need I a need house. a place to live. Why, why, you know, why, why would you buy food well, when prices one. are falling? Well, you go just got to eat. Look, Go rent one and wait for if, the price to fall and then if, buy it later. If you, no, what, have, so do you own a cell phone? 
Do you own a cell phone right now? Why not wait? Buy one when it's cheaper. Do you own a television I can rent set? One. I can rent I one. See, I see a, I see a, exactly. You buy it when you need it and you hope the price goes down. So if you need it again, it's cheaper. Look, in 1900, the CPI was half of what it was in 1800. We had a hundred years of falling prices. We should not be targeting any positive level of prices. Let prices go down 1% a year. Let them go down for 2% a year. Let them go down as fast as the free market can lower them. That is a good thing. When, when your wages go farther, when you can buy more things, that's good. Abundance is good. As you produce more, prices come down. You're shaking your head. You know, I agree with you on one thing. There is no diversity of thought in central banks because all these guys went to the same universities. They worked for the same Wall Street firms, for the same government. There are no Austrians. There are no free market economists Gents. at the Federal Reserve who understand any of this. They don't understand the benefits uh, of sound money and falling prices. How about this, Peter? Peter, they Peter not be at, the, at a central Peter bank. Peter for Fed chairman once it's dissolved. <laughs> well, if I became Fed chairman, that would be what my, my first. There we go, now. Dale. After it's dissolved, we, we need to wrap it up, G gentlemen. Right. We got, we do have to wrap this up. I want. Thank I wanna you, think... Danny. Yeah, go ahead, Dale. Please. Thank you, Danny and Peter. And uh, uh, how about a virtual handshake and a round of applause? So, All right. for you both, yeah, then, yeah, we, we, we we appreciate uh, that you guys came here and had this discussion. <laughs> yeah, so Listen, really, I think the clock helped. Okay, so I, they, really, they, I think they, I think I think Morrow's intervention was the most helpful. The, the I, I, the I, need a, is, I need a drink is, a lot now, but I enjoyed it. The truth, Dale, is that uh, when people are passionate, there are always yeah. heated discussions, right? Yeah. So things might have gotten out of hand for a minute or so, but I think it. People that watched it uh, really. We learned it. from everybody. Yes, we 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 really want to thank Peter for being with us once again. Uh, and I hope to see him in the next Trader Summit event in six months. And we want to thank uh, Dr. Blanchflower as well for being here and, you know, making this nice debate happen.